All right, so um, we're up to uh, the second lesson in, our, in the study of Hebrews tonight. And I just want to start by showing you a picture of my grandson. Um, this is the first picture we got of, this is our first one. <laughs> and I, uh, this is the first picture we got of Reed when uh, Laura showed him to us when she was uh, expecting Reed. Um, he's two years old now. But we, you can't see very much there, just his head, his little trunk, little legs and arms a little bit. And so we didn't see a lot in this picture, but it was enough to make us excited about what was coming. This is what he looks, this is what he looks like now. This is Reed. He's two years old. He's just so wonderful. I love him to death. And you, you have grandchildren, you know the same thing. He's, <laughs> your grandkids are just the best. But, when I was studying and preparing for this lesson, what I realized is the Bible is a little bit like that sonogram picture that I showed you at the beginning. And, and uh, it gives us a picture of Jesus, right? And we know who he is, but it's not fully developed yet. We don't see Jesus face to face yet, but we have enough information from what we read in scriptures to make us excited about what coming and it should give us enough motivation to make us want to live in a way that pleases him when we do finally experience him face to face right so that's kind of what the book of hebrews is all about and if you were here with us last time you know that this book was written to a group of persecuted hebrew christians and they they were persecuted yes by rome but also by their fellow jewish brethren and it became to such a level that they were ostracized from their community and from their families and their friends. They couldn't do business, those kinds of things, that it had put enough pressure on them that it made them want to drift back to the old rituals and laws of the Old Testament. And they began adding these things back to the message of Jesus. And it's the same time, hopefully, I think in their mind, you know, maybe it wasn't conscious, but they were trying to reduce their offensiveness to their peers. That is, the Jews were like, yeah, we don't, we don't like that whole Jesus thing, but come back and do the things that you used to do. Don't tell us that we need to let go of the law or those kinds of things. We, and, and if you, if you do that, then we'll just stop giving you such a hard time. So the temptation was to sort of just kind of go along with them, and maybe it's not that big a deal after all. And if you think this book is kind of irrelevant to our, where we are today, um, and because you're like, I'm not Jewish, not going to go back to any law, don't want to do any of that kind of stuff, then just think about the pressure that's starting to heat up on the church today. So you get the message. Don't talk about Jesus being the only way to God. <laughs> don't talk about righteousness. Don't talk about holiness. Don't talk about, certainly don't talk about moral purity, right? Just be quiet about all of that. Um, you can talk about Jesus being your friend. You can talk about Jesus being a good teacher or moral example for how to live. That's okay. But loving your neighbor, helping out with the poor, that's all really good stuff. But please don't say anything about us being sinners about Jesus being the way to God or that God's wrath abides upon people who don't believe in him. Because you know what? That makes everybody uncomfortable. And we don't like being uncomfortable. And if you don't stop making us uncomfortable, we're going we're gonna to start persecuting you. Now, we have a cutesy name for it today in the 21st century. It's called cancel culture, right? But it's the same stuff. There's nothing new under the sun. This is exactly what was happening in the first century. Um, they were where, where these people, these first Hebrews found that the Hebrew Christians found themselves in the first century. It's the same thing. It's like compromise here, compromise there. Don't say anything about this. Don't say anything about that. Um, validate our actions by participating in them. And that's exactly what we're seeing today, right? But the writer of the book of Hebrews comes on really strong and reminds them, you can't do that. You can't call yourself Christian and be a Christian and water down the message of Christ and pick and choose what you want to believe and what you want, don't want to believe. You can't do that. And you can't just say, I like this part of who Jesus is, but not that part over there. And so he dives right into the very first verses of this book 
and and tells them that you uh, that you it makes it clear that Jesus is greater than all these other things. And you remember the symbol. This is kind of what we're doing uh, is our theme for the entire study of this book. It's greater than. You remember this from your elementary school days. It's the mass symbol that the big thing goes on the large size, and the little thing goes on the 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 smaller thing goes on the other side. But Jesus is over here. And everything else for them, the law, the rituals, all the Old Testament stuff, is less than Jesus. And for us in our lives, anything that seems really big, huge in your life, the most important thing is also on that small side. Jesus is the only one over here, and nothing supplants him. And if you remember last time, we looked at a sevenfold revelation of who Jesus is. That, so he's really clear right at the outside the Jesus we're talking about. It's not just the, 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 the uh, feathered-haired, doughy-eyed Jesus out there you see on a, on a picture somewhere. This is the Lord of all creation that he's introducing us to. And so we saw that sevenfold revelation, but what we also see in those first three verses are the three roles that Jesus fulfills for us too. And the first one is prophet. Talked about this a little bit last time too. He's not a normal prophet like an Old Testament prophet. That is, men who received the message of God and then passed it on to other people. He, Jesus, is the final prophet who, by his very coming and showing up, is the de declaration of God. He is the living word himself. And so we have Jesus as prophet, we also have him as priest. See at the end of this verse here, verse 3, it says, after making purification for sin. So that's one of the main things that the high priest did was making sins and intercession for the people of Israel. He went, took sacrifices into the Holy of Holies and interceded for the people. We're going to go into this a whole lot more in depth as we go along because he talks a lot about this later on. But Jesus here is identified in chapter 1 as our great high priest. Now, he didn't just bring the blood of animals before God. He brought his own blood before God. And so he is the priest and he's the sacrifice. There's none greater and his work was full and complete. No more sacrifices were necessary. And then the third role that he has is king. That is, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he's the king who conquered sin and death and sat down and rule and reign at Christ, I mean at God's right hand. Now, at the end of last time had one of our small groups ask me a question about why is it the right hand of God? Why is it not the left hand of God or why is it not just the general hand of God? And so I did research on that to, to kind of figure out what that is. And so all through history, the right hand of the king was the highest position. It was the place of authority. It's the place of the heir. So you would see the king's son sitting there. You would see the, the strongest military ruler sitting there. And so, so why is it left, right and not left? Well, if you are left-handed, don't be offended. <laughs> but it's basic anatomy and basic the way your body works. I know if you are left-handed, you know you live in a right-handed world anyway. So, so, But this is the way it came about is that so me being right-handed, if I want to open a jar of pickles, I go and get me a jar of pickles out and I hold it with my left hand, right? And I take my right hand and exert the power necessary to open the lid the pickles with my right hand. Or if I want to hang a picture on the wall, I hold my left hand, I hold the nail, and with my right hand, I swing the hammer. So the power and the strength necessary to drive the nail or open the pickle jar is with my right hand. So just seeing how your hand functions, if you're right-handed, the left hand, it helps, it supports and holds, and the right hand exerts the power in authority. So symbolically, that became a ruling power, ruling authority, and it became associated with no nobility. The left hand as support and became a reference to more the common people. So the blessings of the Father, if you see in the Old Testament, the blessings of the Father are always given with the right hand. And here and in plenty other places throughout Scripture, you see that Jesus is exalted to that, that place of power 
and authority and the heir at the right hand of God. So I hope that clears it up for you or gave you some information there that you didn't have before. I thought it was interesting. So Jesus here at the beginning is, is identified as the great prophet, our high priest, and the ruling king. And that launches us directly into what we'll talk about for the rest of the time in verse 4. And that's more talking about the superiority of Christ. So we've got that sevenfold uh, understanding of who Christ is. And now we're going to talk about his superiority. And verse 4 talks about the superiority of his name, having become as much support, superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So, okay, he talks about Jesus being superior to angels through this whole section here. Now, angels aren't really part of life for us here in our century. Kind of interesting to talk about spirit, uh, um, supernatural sort of things, but they're kind of a cultural side note. They're kind of just, oh, that's interesting, but they don't influence or we don't think about angels much um, because, especially not like they did, because much of our view and understanding of what an angel is has been corrupted by television, by movies, by popular media. Think about Touched by an Angel or that movie The Good Place um, or many other movies and all that kind of stuff. So nothing you see on those shows or anything like that has anything to do with what a biblical angel is. Is. Now, couple that with what we do at Christmas time and with angels and how we have them hanging around the Christmas tree and they're all sparkly and they're pretty and all of that kind of stuff. We think of angels as being meek and mild and definitely harmless and not some fearsome beings worthy of awe and deference. That's not how we usually think about angels. Now, um, some of you might have been here a few years ago when I taught a Christmas lesson, and there are a lot of people here who weren't here, so this is worth repeating, so just bear with me if you remember it. But we think about angels much like this, right? Little bitty baby, a cherub, or this, a little, uh, you know, uh, sweet little girl with some wings, or floating on a cloud somewhere, but this is not what biblical angels are. They are not cherubs, they're not children, they're not girls, they're not demure creatures flying around in the clouds somewhere. In scripture, the angel's primary assignment is to compose a vast army of God described as the host of heaven. And now, in this context, host has nothing to do with dinner parties, nothing to do with Pinterest, nothing to do with centerpieces or anything like that. The Hebrew word uh, in the Old Testament for host is saba, which means an organized army or a band of soldiers or a military unit. And so it is used over 230 times in the Old Testament. God is described as being the leader of the host of heaven. Now, the Lord of hosts. So in that light, heavenly hosts in scriptures take on a completely different meaning than we sometimes think about, especially from the average TV show or movie out there. The spiritual battle around us is really real and active all the time. If you remember the story from Kings, uh, Elisha, and he, he is surrounded by the army of the Syrians, I think, was and that his servant was afraid. He's like, we're gonna die. It's like, you know, they're gonna. And, and Elisha was like, no, there's more with us than with them. And um, and he's like, I don't see anything. And so he prays and he asks that God would open the eyes of his servants to see the armies of the the angelic army, which he's described as chariots. Of fire. Now, I don't know if that gave that servant comfort or made him more afraid. <laughs> I don't know. But, but the, the, the sky was filled with them. Now, in our spiritual battle and back then, the question of who wins is, is not a thing because we have the end of the story. We know how it's going to unfold. But while we wait for the consummation of all things, don't think that uh, the fallen angels, the demons, have given up. They are here to wreak as much havoc in your life and in the world as possible. So if we think about what the Bible tells us about what an angel looks like, maybe they look a little more like this. And so big, strong, 
mighty, battle-clad warriors in God's army, not playing sweet melodies on a harp somewhere or looking like a five-year-old with tinsel in their hair. That's not what biblical angels are. So keep that in your mind when you roll around to Christmas in a, in a couple of months. So um, now this imagery right here and thinking about what it really means to be an angel in God's army helps us understand why there's this whole section in the beginning of Hebrews talking about why Christ is superior to angels. I mean, if one of these guys shows up in your, in, in your, in your yard here, you're paying attention, right? I mean, you're recoiling in fear here, and maybe the word superior might be what you would pick to describe one of these guys. Surely superior to anything that we have experienced. Now, add to that fact that in the Jewish mindset, angels were held in enormous esteemed during this time because not just because of their strength and their might but because the Jews in this time believed that angels were involved in delivering the law to Moses on Mount Sinai and that's what Stephen alludes to in Acts chapter 7 where he said you who received the law is delivered by angels and now most scholars think that Stephen was referring to Deuteronomy 33 where he talks about the Lord came from Sinai, that's where the law came to him, and he came from the ten thousands of holy ones, and the holy ones which is a reference to angelic beings. And so in the mindset of the Jews there, they believe the law came from God through angels to Moses and then to the Jewish people. So back then, angels were seen as real and powerful and active, significant messengers of God in bringing the law. And because the Jewish people um, revered the law so greatly, they then uh, um, revered angels very highly because they were involved in bringing it to them. So the, the author of Hebrews acknowledges and says, yes, Angels are powerful, they are great, they are awesome beings worthy of respect, not worship, but respect, but as great as they are, they are no comparison to how great Jesus is. So back in verse 4, he says that, they, they're, that his name is more superior than, their, than theirs is. Now, in the Bible, we only get three names of angels. We have Michael, we have Gabriel, and we have Lucifer, and he, of course, became Satan when he fell. But we can assume that maybe all the angels have names. And so uh, this verse here says that Jesus is superior to all angels, named and unnamed to us, but his name is greater than theirs. Now, what's the name that the author is referring to here? And he tells us in verse 5, in two quotes, in Psalms and 2 Samuel, the name God gave to Jesus, the name that is above every other name, is the name Son. And you see that right there. You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. Down here he says, and he shall be to me a Son. So Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, just like John 3.16 tells us. He's greater than angels because he's completely different from them of the same essence and likeness with the Father, co-eternal, co-equal with Him. And we talked about that some the last time we were together. So the writer, writer reminds us here that the name Son means that He is altogether unique from these created angelic beings and every other created being as well. And so because of that, He demands higher worship and esteem. So second, uh, I mean, Philippians chapter 2 echoes this and tells us over there that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. That means that it's not just the people who love him, but also the people who hate him. And what it means is that the most defiant opposers of Christianity will one day realize who he is and will fall before him in worship. Remember, no one's greater, and no one supplants him ever. And so the superiority of Christ is also in his authority, and that's what we see in verses 6 and 7, where it tells us that angels 
worship him. And we see that Christ's authority here in uh, Deuteronomy 32 and Psalm 104, it talks about them worshiping and serving him. And it's not a future thing that's going to happen later on. It's a forever thing in both directions. Eternity, past, present, and future. These angels exist to serve and to worship him. It's also his superiority is that his kingdom endures forever, verses 8 and 9. And so um, that's Psalm 45, another quote from the Old Testament. Now we tend to get kind of upset about the things that are going on in the world around us sometimes, especially in election cycle, especially when you see the chaos and all the things that have been going on so much around us now. It's kind of anxiety-inducing sometimes, <laughs> and we're like, wait, what's going on in our world here? And we're concerned about what will happen later on. But if you believe in Jesus and are part of his kingdom, we don't really need to worry. We don't really have a good reason that we can put out there to have a lot of anxiety about things, even when things are not going the way we want them to. So um, he spoke to these, the writer spoke to this group here that was so influenced by attacks on them by a culture. A lot of times it was very physical in nature, and he reminded them that they, as believers in Jesus, were part of a kingdom that was above and beyond and greater than and more enduring than the most powerful kingdoms on earth. And, of course, to them it would be Rome. It was so influential, so overarching, so impactful to them in, in every level of their lives. I mean, they made laws, they provided st stability, they uh, protection, they built roads and brought water and provided entertainment and had philosophy and theater and all this stuff that Rome brought to the people. Now, of course, it came with a lot of immorality and idolatry, which was no doubt concerning to them, just like it is to us today. But here we are, right? I mean, Rome is nothing to us. It's what about we read in history books? Or we buy a plane ticket and we drop fly over to Italy and we pay $50 to tour worn down buildings and crumbled monuments. Rome is not anything like it was. Its splendor is gone. Now these people in the first century could not imagine a time when it would be like that. Now, we're the same, right? We cannot imagine a time when the United States would not be as influential and strong as it is in our time, right? But evidence of history tells us a completely different story. So should Jesus come back, all the kingdoms of the earth that seem so powerful and immovable fade away. Egypt, Persia, Assyria, Rome, England, Spain, China, the United States will crumble and one day fade into the fabric of history should Jesus wait to come back. Only one kingdom will endure. And an angel in Revelation tells us that he shall reign forever and ever and ever. And so don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Don't be tempted to compromise because all that you see here in front of you that seems so enduring is not. Right? Only his kingdom and the things that he, he establishes through his power and his authority will endure. His throne, which is established and ruling right now, will never end. No kingdom is greater than his. He has all authority. And so the superiority of Jesus is also in that he's eternal creator. That's what we see in verses 10 through 12. And we talked about this last time we were together, so I won't go into it much, but just remind us that uh, Hebrews and other places in Scripture remind us that G Jesus is the creator God. He, God spoke in the sending of his Son. Who is the creator of the universe, which is what verse 1 says of this chapter. And not just the things that we can see and touch and taste and experience with our, uh, our senses, but everything that is underneath that, all the things we experience with our five senses, rests on the things that he also 
created and all the physics, all the mathematics, all the science, all the biology, all of those things we studied in school or your kids are studying now, those things are just developed by people in an attempt to explain the complexity of what God has created through Christ. Now we should stand back and marvel, right? It's amazing stuff out there. We only understand a little, but he made all beauty all complexity that we will never fully understand and grasp. And so Christ is superior also because he's the victorious conqueror. That's what we see in verse 13 there. And so this is a quote from Psalm 110, which is actually quoted five times in the New Testament. Very significant verse. And Jesus himself in, in the book of Matthew applies this quote to himself. And so... Here we only get part of the whole verse that's quoted elsewhere in the New Testament. But it brings us again back to the subject of angels as we kind of wrap up the end of this, this chapter here. And it reminds us about the clear separation be, between Christ and any other messenger of God and uh, that he is the victorious conqueror. And though we know that these angels are very powerful and amazing beings. They are still warriors in a battle with other powerful fallen warriors. And if it was just up to them, we might go, I don't know, who's going to win? There's some crazy stuff going on. But because Jesus is in the mix here, he doesn't need any help. The battle is never in question. If uh, the, uh, the book of Revelation that we'll get to later on in our study on Sunday morning, that um, you see that movies like to make a whole lot about the, the Battle of Armageddon. But if you actually read what's in there, all these kings amassed to come take on Jesus, but Jesus shows up and, and it's over like that. Not a lot of fighting going on. So we don't have to worry about what the outcome is. But... Um, so some people apply this, this as the enemies having at footstool, uh, his enemies being a footstool for uh, Christ's feet as being a future thing. That is, when he comes the second time. But I actually think this is a now verse as well, because, think about it, are we as believers in Jesus waiting for the enemies of God to be defeated? Are we waiting for that to happen? No. When, was, when, were, the, when were the enemies of God defeated? On the cross, right? On the cross and at the resurrection, uh, he crushed the power of the enemy. And so uh, there's a couple of verses for you to write down and read these later. But in 1 John, there's two verses there and one in 1 Corinthians 15. We're not waiting for round for these to happen because these verses either are in the past tense or are present realities. And so the final expulsion, of course, of, of Satan into the lake of fire is yet to happen from our perspective, but the crushing of his power has already happened. And so you can see here that the Son of God appeared past tense to destroy the works of the devil. And that you, uh, he says in uh, chapter 4, 4, he says, are we waiting for him to, that he's already greater in us than he's who's in the world. In verse 15, it says, Thanks be to God who gives us, present tense, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, back to verse 13 of Hebrews. This is a rhetorical question, right? And through Psalm 110, there's an obvious answer. It says, to who, which of the angels has God said, sit at my right hand, and I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And the obvious answer is, none. Right? And so... Um, the, so here at the end of chapter 1, it reminds us of one more thing about angels, which he tells us in verse 14. It tells us what the role of angels is. And so without getting into whether we have guardian angels and all that kind of stuff, this is encouraging, right? It says, are they not angels? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So part of what angels do is to serve God by doing his will in regards to, his, to believers, to us. So the Bible shows us that so, a lot of ways that that happens, sometimes it's a part of God answering prayers. Remember the story of Peter in Acts, that the believer, he was in prison and the believers were gathered around and they were praying 
for uh, G uh, Peter to be released from the prison. And an angel shows up, opens the door, and leads him out of prison. He also, another place where angels shows up to encourage Paul in Acts chapter 27, where he's in a storm at sea. Or he should, angels show up to protect believers, like in Daniel in the lion's den. So the point of this verse here at the end, in context, is not get sidetracked by looking for where angels are, but to tell us that angels are not authority figures. But they do the will of God in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's bringing a message, like in the Christmas story a couple of times, or bringing judgment like you're going to see over in the book of Revelation. But none are in authority. They're doing the will of Christ. Remember, the seat at the right hand of God is already taken. It's by Jesus. And nobody tells him to get up. Now, that's the end of chapter 1. But I always like to give you a, a, a takeaway from it. So as we kind of wrap this up, I'll just give you a little uh, thoughts to write down to kind of apply, for, apply as we wait till next week. But I went through this whole study of this chapter and uh, there's so much about Jesus in here. We could just study and study and study and never plumb the depths of what it's trying to tell us here. But you know what we don't see? You and me. We're not mentioned one single time in the whole first chapter of Hebrews. No command to do this or don't do that or uh, follow through on this. Now, we're going to get to that next time. That comes really quickly in chapter 2. But right here in this section, we don't see that. Everything is about who Jesus is and how great he is. And so what I think our takeaway for this is that it's a good thing to train us which way to look when we're reading the book of Hebrews or the whole Bible in itself. And so, because um, the whole world is going to tell you when you come to anything to come at it with what's in it for me, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a, a prevailing attitude. But anytime we do that with Scripture, we're going to wind up uh, off base really, really quickly. Now, that's not to say there's not a ton of things in Scripture that we need to apply and work at applying in our lives. Um, and there's lots of thou shalt and thou shalt not verses kind of stuff in there that we need to take seriously because if they come from God, these are not suggestions. These are not things for us to consider. Eh, maybe I'll do it. Maybe I won't. That's not the way we need to ever approach the, the, the commands of Scripture because they're given to us to apply. But the primary thing we need to do when we read Scripture, Hebrews or any other book, is uh, to begin to end with Jesus. And if you've been around my teaching long enough, you know I have one question I always say when you're reading uh, uh, through the scriptures is ask yourself this primary question. What do I learn about God from this? And if you start there, it's going to help you understand, especially the Old Testament, when you're going, why am I reading this thing about this battle, about people that don't, don't even exist anymore? Why do I have to learn about all these hard names and what's going on in a place that I have no idea where it is? Well, so you're not looking for what's it saying to me. You're looking for what does it say about God. And you can learn that from every part of Scripture, including the Kings and Chronicles, and even Le Leviticus and Numbers. You can learn that from there if you approach it with this right attitude. Because listen, and even when you get over to the New Testament, you got to remember that the New Testament is not just a new book of laws like the Old Testament. That is bunch of rules and regulations that say, if you don't do this, you're going to get in trouble. That's not what it is. Now, a lot of people think that that's what Christianity is all about, right? You've probably heard people say this. I don't want your religion. I want your God that's telling me not what I can't do, because I want to do what I want to do, and I don't need to go to church and listen to somebody tell me and make me feel bad about what I want to do. And I don't like a religion that stops me from doing those things. And now, whenever you have somebody who says something like that, what it tells you is that attitude, whoever said it, doesn't know who God is. They don't understand him at all because they assume that God is out there trying to take something away from them instead of giving to us with overwhelming generosity beyond what we can imagine, beyond what we can think. So. 
because so many of the things that we want to pursue, even as Christians, will destroy us if we pursue them long enough. Because remember, the offer of sin is deceptive. The prey promises what it will never, ever deliver. It will take you further than you thought, keep you longer than you planned, and cost you more than you can ever imagine. His commands are designed first to save us from destruction, that is eternal destruction, but also destruction in your life right now. Doesn't mean that if you follow him, uh, that you're not going to have any suffering, because suffering is God's greatest tool to develop Christ-like character within us. And we'll study about what, how he uses discipline to keep us uh, in suffering and discipline to keep us in line and conform us to the in, in image of Christ when we get over to chapter 12. But remember that God is a good God, and he is like a good parent who gives us rules to protect us from harm. And what we need to do is first to learn about the good heart of our Father, and when we begin to learn who He is, that's why we read the Scripture so we can see who He is, you're going to learn about His great love for you. He is not out there trying to take things from you, but to give overwhelmingly to you. And the first gift He gives is His supreme Son, Jesus Christ. As we wrap this up, um, I have to tell you, there's this coworker that I used to work with years and years and years ago. And uh, whenever you would walk past him in the hall and you would say, uh, how you doing? He would frequently say, <laughs> he would say, Jesus saved me. When I die, I'm going to heaven. Everything else is gravy. <laughs> and I always liked that because that's kind of the attitude we need to adopt. And it's exactly what Hebrews is telling us. Jesus has already done the thing that we need most in providing for the forgiveness of our sins, right? We have that. Whether I get this thing or that thing or don't get this thing over here or things are, are difficult over there, it shouldn't really matter as much as that first thing, right? That we have all that we need already given to us for life and godliness, First Peter tells us. And after that... The rest of it shouldn't matter as much. So if you're a believer, you can rest in the truth that Jesus is always greater than, right? He has already given you everything you will ever need. And everything else is gravy. Amen? God, we just thank you for the reminder of your superiority. And when things just go crazy all around us, it can seem like so many th other things are in control. Um, but God, thank you for the reminder that it's only you that's in control and that you have already seen the end from the beginning. God, help us to have the faith, the trust, and walk. God, give us a desire to know who you are to understand your good heart toward us and that we can trust you even when we experience pain and confusion and suffering and disappointment. God, you are greater than. Jesus, you're greater than. Help us to walk in that truth. For it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.